Well, good morning, everybody. Morning. I love uh, the holiday season. I love the things that come with it. Uh, I don't know if I love uh, atmospheric rivers all the time to enjoy the things that I'm hoping for. Um, yesterday, I was looking out the window and the rain didn't stop. And then I started hearing the sound outside of one of the windows and it looked like one of my gutters was ready to break off <laughs> of the house because it was so full of water. And all it took was one little unclogging of one little part of it to see a complete gushing of a geyser out of a, a drain. And it just helped me to realize um, we're not used to things wet falling from the sky here. Uh, and it makes us feel like things might be inconvenient when it's needed. It made me start to think about a lot of things in my life that I feel are inconvenient but they're really needed for me. And uh, this time of year helped me to remember some of that. And sometimes going to a bunch of different things, to spend time with family, to spend time with friends, sometimes can feel inconvenient. But when you're there, man, does it feel like my soul just needed it. Uh, yesterday we were around a bunch of Renee's friends for one of our first little holiday parties to see a house kind of filled with little voices and gigantic dogs and people just getting together and sharing food and enjoying the company of one another uh, was something that uh, my soul kind of felt like it needed. And, uh, uh, what's interesting though is we were doing a little karaoke. My ear is still plugged. Nothing worse than hearing yourself on top of a karaoke that tells you how out of tune you are. <laughs> to just let you know, sometimes we think we might be better at something than we don't. But it, we had a great time, uh, and it helped me to start to think about this time uh, of, of year as the gift, right? We've been talking about this uh, in our series. We started last week as this anticipated hope. This gift that comes to us, anticipating what is to come of Jesus and how everybody must have been so excited knowing that a Savior was coming, but missed it when it was right in front of their face. A hope that is so evident and so needed, but yet when it was here, all that they could think about is it didn't fit the mold of who they anticipated in their minds. Today we're going to be looking at something different, and I think this gift is probably the best gift of all that comes from the gift of a savior, from the birth of a child, which is the gift of love. I want to read something. Um, I think I have it up here. You can read it with me. I want to read something. I read. I, I took this out of an article. I, I was looking into this gift of love, and I'm going to be pulling a bunch of excerpts from uh, the book called uh, "The Greatest Gift" from Ann Boss Camp this morning. But this is what I said. This really kind of affected me when I was going through the prep for uh, for this week's sermon. It says. Love was the moving, controlling attribute in God's great means of saving sinners. Justice may have demanded it. Holiness may have required it. Wisdom may have planned it. And power may have executed it. But love originated the whole and was the moving cause in the heart of God so that the salvation of the sinners is not so much a manifestation of the justice or holiness, or wisdom, or power of God, as it is a display of His love. And I love to look at the whole mode of what God is doing within the time from the beginning to when He calls us home is an operation of His love for us. The choosing of sending Jesus to earth was not something that had to come about because we screwed up. It was a plan knowing that this would be the route and the only way to him would be to bring Jesus into the picture. A sacrifice of love that we may have atonement to be with him for eternity. If we look at, at just viewing it as it's the only way, it's like this justice that needed to happen or God's wisdom makes it where this is so, we lose sight of how much he loves us, that he chooses us, that this was a process of knowing the sacrifice that would come in being a God of us as his people. And so we're going to look into uh, a bunch of different things. I want to read some excerpts from this book because I feel like it really hits the point. Um, this morning we read this verse and it says, uh, this is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. We cannot have a Christmas message just by thinking about a baby who was born uh, in a manger. Uh, that is just part of the true story. The real story is 
that God loved us so much that he would offer his son to die for our sins. And part of that would have to be his son came to earth to be born a, born a humble bird. Without it, we wouldn't have the sacrifice. And I want us just to take in that we can't have Christmas without an Easter. We can't have an Easter without a Christmas. We can't have any of it without a God who loves us from the beginning, who would see us as we are and choose us in spite of ourselves. It's hard for us to comprehend truly the depth of what that love looks like. And so I'm going to read this from, uh, and this, is, this won't be up on the screen, so I'm going to read it. Uh, I love how this comes out of the book called The Greatest Gift, and it says something like this. Our God, who breathes stars in the dark, he breathes Bethlehem star and takes on lungs and breathes in stable air. And we are saved from hopelessness because God came with infant fists and opened wide his hand to take the iron sharp edge of our sin. Our God who forms and delivers the black of the heavens, he waves patiently like an embryo in the womb and delivers himself free. And delivers himself to free you. We are saved from forever pain because God pierced the dark and came to the pinpoint of us in the universe and took the nails. Our God who cradles the whole galaxies in the palm of his hand, whose highest heavens cannot contain, he folds himself into our skin and he uncurls his newborn fingers in the cradle of a barn feeding trough. And we are saved from ourselves. We are saved from our loneliness because God is love and he can't stand to leave us by ourselves to ourselves. And that is the Christmas message that we need a Messiah. I love the imagery of what this book portrays that God who creates the heavens and the earth that, that the heavens can't even contain him is willing to fold himself into us that he would walk this earth and see what we go through and know the pain and know the temptation and is willing to take it all on and not only take it all on but even as being a perfect form of who we are willing to take on our sins that those little baby hands that stretched out in a manger also the human hands that stretch out on the cross and take the nails that save us ourselves. I love the way that this looks that God can't stay away. This book continues on to say this. The love story that has been coming for us since the beginning, God who walked with us in the garden the pool of the evening before the fall shattered our looseness with him is the God who came after his people in a pillar of a cloud of fire because he could not bear to let his people wander alone. He is a God who loves us and likes us and isn't merely 50% or 72.3% of us, but the God who is always unequivocally 100% for us. The God who is for us, that he is the God who chooses to be with us. I love to think about the pursuit that God had in his heart for us. Continually that he found ways to constantly show up and fulfilled it all in showing up as Christ, Savior born in a manger, one who'd be willing to die for our sins. John, uh, oh, Isaiah 9, 6 that we read last week tells us that this, that a child is born. For us, a child is born. Son is given. That everything is going to be weighed on his shoulders, and he's going to be called the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That when Christ comes and what is explained about him is measured up completely in John 3.16 and 17. That God so loved us, loved this world, that he gave his one and only son. Whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Have you ever stopped and really reflected on how much God loves you? One of the 
You know, we have this anticipation of hope that we talked about last week. It's not just an anticipation of love that we're talking about this week. It's actually the acceptance of just being overwhelmed and gushed upon by a God who loves you so much that he pursues you. That he's not made in the same human mindset that where if somebody betrays you or if somebody uh, hurts your feelings that they decide to push away from you because they don't want that anymore. But instead, God does the opposite and pursues you. Even through your sinful struggle, that he pursues you because of his deep love for you. That he says, I want you to know who you really are in me. I want you to know that you can be fully loved, fully forgiven, and you can be fully mine. My child who will be in eternity with me to celebrate the close connection to God. I was sitting with a friend the other day and we were talking about this idea that we think that we are, when we read scripture sometimes, it says we're going to be a new creation in Christ. And sometimes I think that new creation is just understanding and identifying that we are to be transformed into the image that God had for us already from the beginning. Not just to be made new completely, but to remind ourselves that we were not built to be what this world has made us to be. That God created us to do great things, to be his masterpiece, to do the good work that he had planned for us to do. He had created us to be the image in his likeness from the beginning. And as we start to learn of his love, and as we start to learn of his grace and his forgiveness, I think that starts to help us chisel away the blocking that the world has put on us to make us look different. To reform us back in the image that God had for us from the beginning of time. That we would be his children, created to be like him. One of my favorite memories is uh, holding my, my newborn babies. Um, we had Kyle, we had Grayson. And, and for some reason, I'm glad they look more like the mom. But also, for some reason, I said, eat this. They hold something that is a me. We celebrated Grace and Heaven 4.0 uh, this past year, and I said, oh, that is part of your mom. But then he did a nice little project where he had to present something in front of the group. We did it so well, I said, that's part of me. You learn how to talk a lot and be loud because of me, that's part of me too. But we have this great little feeling when you molded, you made, you held this precious child that's yours. And it doesn't feel the same when you hold other people's kids. You might still be like, oh, it's so cute. It's great. But you don't feel it. Thank God every time he sees us and views us, even when we're screwing up, even when we don't have it all together, it's still this thing that says, I see me in you. I still see who you are. I still see who you are to be. And you're worth pursuing. And I think that changes, or hopefully changes, the way in which we should see each other too. I think without understanding fully God's love, we might lose sight of the love that we should have for each other too. We see that God loves us when a child is born and all. As the story would go, right, the, the Christmas story goes and everything was calm. All is calm. All is quiet. in the silent night. I want to read one more that excerpt of this book. It says, This night, on the night that Jesus comes, a battle has been waged and won for you. That love had come back for you. Love had to get to you. The love that has been coming for you since the beginning, he slays dragons for you. This is the truest love story of history, and it is his story. And it is for you. This is love you can't comprehend. You can only feel and touch this kind of love. There in the place where you feel rejected, you can be touched by God. There in the places that you feel small, you can be touched by God. He came in flesh. He came for us. As we start to really prepare ourselves for this true like Advent season, we have two more Sundays before Christmas comes and we're preparing ourselves and we're trying to 
put ourselves in this mindset of what it would be like to be excited for this gift of Jesus who's coming for us. I like the approach of knowing there is this hope that we anticipate that because of Jesus I have a hope in the future. Because of the Messiah coming, I have a hope to be forgiven. Because of him, I have a hope of the future of the eternity. But also because of him, I love deeply. Because of Jesus coming to this earth, I know how deeply and cherished and loved I am by God. Who sees me like nobody else sees me. Who knows my innermost secrets and chooses still to love me. I don't know if we can say that about anybody else, but it is truly what our Christmas story is. A pursuit of love from God. So I guess the question would be is, if we know how loved we are by God and pursued by Him, are we willing to show that same love for others? Are we willing to show and pursue others with the same forgiveness, with the same intensity of love, knowing of what God did for us. This morning in Bible class, it's a great commercial for all of you to come to Zoom Bible class. It's not as inconvenient as you think. You can still be in your pajamas, which is why it's nice. But the whole process of our story this morning in class was, how do we forgive people? Why does God choose to forgive us? Why should we not judge or hold other people in different, you know, uh, uh, places because of how God has chosen to forgive us too? And this is part of the story. If I know that in my worst, God still chose to love me and forgive me, why would I be unwilling to do that for other people? The story of Christmas isn't just one that we can just take it all in and know that it's for us, but it also should transform how we behave and think and operate. It should change the way in which we view the world and the people around us. It should change the compassion we see for those who are in need, and those who are the widows and the orphans of our world today should change our hearts to know that the Christmas story isn't just for me to hold in my heart for myself, but for me to share with the world to know of the Savior who pursues them too. And maybe that pursuit is done through us as the vessel of God's love while we're here and waiting for His return to us. The Christmas story comes from hearts that are open and passionate to be changed by what God has for us through the Son. So, if we do this together, could it start with a prayer? A prayer for the person that you're hoping that God puts in your life to share this message. An actual, proactive prayer that's intentional that says, God, I want you to help me illuminate my eyes to see the person that you have for me that needs to hear the story in my life. Or the one that needs to feel compassion that hasn't felt it. Or the person that needs to experience love that hasn't been gifted to me before. And there are many people who have this life. The other day, I was sitting with a group of high school kids that were kicked out of school and had to go to a special type of school. And, and we were talking about resiliency, and, and as we talked about resiliency, it bled out into um, some really sad moments that helped me to understand that people really need the gift of love. As I sat, we were talking about what does the word resilient mean, and a lot of them said it's just how we handle hard days, things like that. You know, not quitting when something gets too hard. That decent answer is. We started to talk about uh, part of being resilient is learning how to handle difficult things. Uh, you know, life doesn't get easier, but, but also part of it is to be vulnerable so that other people might be able to help you on the journey. And a bunch of the kids said, uh, life is easier when you push everybody away so you don't have to get hurt anymore by them. Uh, another young man said, uh, life is set up for me to be hard because I don't have parents, uh, life is really difficult. That story has legs that I'll share in a minute. And all of them had hurt in their lives or somebody who they thought should have loved them hurt them. 
And because of that, they are jaded to want to receive love because they're afraid of being hurt again. When you hear that, it makes you feel like, could I play a role in someone's life that might just shape them into something different? I got to talk to a kid who didn't want to talk to anybody, but he felt like he could trust me a little bit, which was, I, I was I'm very thankful uh, that he was safe with that. He was part of a shooting that happened a couple of days ago, uh, and he felt like his whole life was set up for him to go in a process of uh, destruction. Like his dad was in jail, uh, mom was uh, an addict, brother was murdered because he was in a gang, he followed suit, and just feels like this is the route it's supposed to go because this is how you feel connected and a part of something. And he was afraid. And as you talk to him, you shouldn't be afraid. If the consequences of your choices are coming up to you, but it doesn't mean it has to dictate who you are and who you become. Nobody ever told me he could be anything else other than what he felt he could be, which was another number or another person in jail or whatever. And we sat and we talked about it for a while, and I don't know if anything's going to change. I said, I'm not ever going to make you change what you want to do or what you want to be. I just want you to know that there's other options, that you can be pursued in a different way, that love can heal a wound that you aren't allowing to, that you can forgive yourself, but more importantly, you're forgivable. And these have never been shared with him before. And I saw a tough kid have a moment where he was vulnerable enough to kind of want something different for his life. Now, he's going to go home and he's probably going to make some bad choices again. I'm not expecting him to figure it out overnight. But he's never had somebody. Could you think about how you, in whatever way it is, you're not all going to be dealing with tough kids in a school because you don't have that access. You may have people in your life who may have never felt the words like, I can be forgiven or I can be loved, or I can be successful, or I can be part of a family, or I can be held and cherished and pursued. And when we have those moments, it's God using us as a vessel of people who have received this idea that we are loved by God and we want Him to be our Savior. And now we are interacting with God in a way that we are part of His team to share and to pursue and to give a message of healing words and actions. Love this time of year. And some things that can be so inconvenient can also be so needed. It is inconvenient to talk to people about things that are difficult. And you might not feel like you have all the words. But when you do it and you're in it, it's so needed. It's so well received. And so healing for yourself too. Allow God to work in you pursue you, but don't let it start stop there. Hopefully his pursuit in you allows you to pursue others in part too. Let's get that. Then finally, you're amazing, awesome, wonderful God. We don't deserve much uh, from you, but you chose to give us a king's reward. Even in our failing even in our struggle with sin, you love us. You see through us the image of you that you created us to be. God, I pray we don't shy away from that. We don't search for success, or we don't search to be loved in worldly ways, but instead we allow you to overflow us with the abundance of blood that you've already shown us that you've given us. To sit, reflect, celebrate, how cherished we are that you would be heaven, that the God of everything, the creator of all, would choose to put himself in his creation to bear the weight of the world that we may have forgiveness, redemption, reconciliation with you. God, I pray that you help us as your children to be compassionate and loving and kind for the rest of your creation that you put around us. Whether or not, if they receive you or not, God, but just to do it because you've done it for us. The impact on our world that we can make, if they're just kind and compassionate. God. God, I pray that you stir in our hearts an openness to be filled by your spirit to move forward. We're on the scene for your sunset. Amen.
Amen. We're outside of Christ, we want to know what it means.